This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. So glad to see you today. So glad to have you joining us, tuning in today. And I pray that God will speak to your hearts and that you will be able to feel the move and the touch of his spirit in a wonderful way. Well, our scriptural text today comes from Genesis chapter 32, uh, verse 24 down through verse 29, reading from the New Living Translation. Notice there these words. This left Jacob alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. And then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. And then he blessed Jacob there. I want to talk today from the subject, the touch from above, the touch from above. I, I didn't understand it, but some years ago, I would, I would hear old folks say that I, I wouldn't have a religion that I couldn't feel sometimes. And if you're going to have genuine relationship with God, you ought to not just be able to hear him, you ought to be able to feel him. Isn't it interesting in, in some of our colloquial expression when we understand what a person is saying to us, we say, yeah, yeah, I feel you. I feel you. Uh, what it means is that what you said to me has touched me in a way that I understand what you mean. So here Jacob is wrestling with an angel of God. He's God's representative. And so he, the angel tells him, you've wrestled with God and won. Isn't it amazing that if you're wrestling with something, and generally you wrestle with things in a place of isolation while you're all alone. I don't know about you, but some of my greatest revelation has come out of isolation. Don't ever uh, fear when God has put you in a position where other people can't necessarily identify with you and connect with you right at the moment because maybe God is isolating you before he elevates you. Uh, when you come out of that place of isolation, particularly when you've been touched by God, something is going to be changed in you because when this angel wrestled with Jacob all night and he said, let me go, and he wouldn't let him go, and he said, you know what, I, I, I got to bless you because you know what, you, you wrestled the tenacity, the determination that you have. You have such a hunger to be changed because he had lived with the stigma of a name, Jacob, deceiver, all of his life. And he's like, I don't want to go another day. So he had a tenacity in him. That was such a desperation in him that he's like, I'm not going to turn you loose. I've got a hold of the holy right now. I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I've touched God. God is touching me. And I'm not going to turn loose until I get blessed. And, and, and then he asked him, he says, what's your name? And he was really identifying him that the thing that has caused you to live under a curse is what you've been calling yourself. And, and not merely what you've been calling yourself, but more specifically what you have been answering to. It doesn't matter what people call you, but it does matter what you answer to. And so he'd been answering every time somebody called him, hey, 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 deceiver. Hey, 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 supplanter. You, you, you're the, the, the underhanded schemer. Hey, hey. And he had been responding to that. He says, from this day forward, you'll never respond to that name again. He said, from now, your name will be Israel. You'll be a prince with God. 
Because the name became synonymous with his identity. And he wrestled with God and God touched him in the hollow of his hip. That hip was out of joint. Because when you've wrestled with God, when you walk after that, you will never walk the same. And God left a limp in his life for the rest of his life to identify that you have wrestled with God. You went through a defining moment. This moment has defined your life. You'll never walk the way that you had ever walked again because the, the Bible says that the sinew there in, in his hip, it drew up and so it sort of, it's like it left one leg shorter than the other. And he walked with a limp and it was to remind him of this divine encounter where he had been touched by God. And it, it bothers me that we live now in a culture that is moving more and more toward touchless and contactless communication. Where we are designed by God to be touched. Not in a perverted way, but to be touched in a way that communicates love and care and meaning and significance. And it was a touch that changed Jacob. He was touched from above. Not a common touch. This was a touch that came from God and we've got too many people that have been living in existence in this day and time and they've never really known the touch of God. Uh, doctors even tell us, psychologists, that touch, it, it leads to a decrease in violence in children. Uh, as adults, when they have received sufficient touch as a child, it, they have decreased violence in their life. Uh, when people are touched, they, it communicates and it leads to greater trust between individuals. Just through a touch, that they have greater trust. Uh, they tell us that when children are touched sufficiently, that they have a decrease in disease and they have strengthened immune systems. It strengthens your immune system just through a touch. Uh, when you touch people, you have greater learning engagement. You know, some children are visual learners. Some children are auditory learners. Some children are tactile learners. They have to touch. They have to be involved in it. And sometimes our boys get left behind because oftentimes they are tactile learners. And that's why if you ever see little boys, you know, and even when it grows in, into grown men, you know, the way that men touch, we think that ladies are just feel good, touchy feely kind of people. But if you've ever observed grown men dapping each other up, hugging each other, football players slapping each other on the behind, psh, we, we are really touchy feely kind of kind of people and it builds a camaraderie it doesn't mean that hey hey I'm trying to do something funny with you but it, it, it says hey 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 man you know you, 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 you're my boy it communicates something that uh, there is a greater engagement there when there's a touch to a child that is upset it brings greater calm a greater sense of security in that person and then here's one of the special things that it does it causes a greater release in this hormone called oxytocin, the love hormone. Isn't that amazing? Just through the, the touch. And, and, and now we've got all of these digital devices where couples used to be really hugged up on each other and laying on each other. Now they are separated looking at their own digital device. And we don't touch nearly as much and, and we're getting sicker because we don't get the, the touch. But there is equally in the realm of the spirit where through other substitutes we have intellectualized ourselves not to feel as though we need a touch from God but I don't care how smart you get and how many laws of success and how much money you get and how many degrees you get you still need a touch from God to be whole you're a spirit you're a body you're a mind and there is a touch there's a void a God-shaped void inside of every human being. And only God's touch can fill that. Only God's touch. So I, I want to talk to you about the touch of the Lord. The touch of the Lord. And, 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 and share some different areas that the touch of the Lord actually impacts our life. What it does. The touch of the Lord, number one, it heals. 
it heals. It heals. The touch of the Lord heals. I want you to notice Mark chapter 8, verse 23 through 25. Notice this. You've heard me talk about this before. Then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Begged him to touch him. They begged him to touch him. He's blind. Uh, I beg you, touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and uh, had put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. And then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up and he was restored. And everyone saw clearly Jesus healed this man because he touched him. He could have done it by the word alone, but he said, you know what? I, I need to touch this brother. He's blind. He has no vision. I need to touch his life. His life needs a touch from above. And Jesus came down from above to then touch his life. And I want you to see here in the story, it, it, you know, I, I, I talked up from this passage about the second touch and how when Jesus touched him the first time, his vision was not cleared. And then he touched him again and then it, it cleared up. He had to have a second touch. I'm just telling you, we're living in a day now where it's time for a second touch. Uh, we've had the former rain, but we need a latter rain. To give us a second touch now. We need another divine encounter with God. I didn't say another philosophy. I, I didn't say another uh, teaching series. I, I mean a touch from God. A touch from God. There's some things that will never be changed in us until we get a touch from God. And, uh, and, and when, I, when I really studied the passage more carefully, I, I, I realized that I had miscounted. It wasn't a second touch. It was actually a third touch. Because if you'll notice back in Mark chapter 8... In verse 22, then he came to Bethsaida and they sought, they, they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. And so notice here's the first touch. He took the blind man by the hand. That was the first touch. Your first touch ought to be giving a person a hand. It ought to be relational. It ought to be reaching out even before you try to speak life and to try to correct them and to do all of that. You need to build relational equity. You don't even have a right to talk to, 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 to everybody. Listen, I mean, everybody has the right to speak. Hear me carefully. Everybody has the right to speak, but you must earn the right to be heard. It is the touching of the hand that actually gives you the right to be heard because they understand me that even while I'm living in darkness and walking in darkness and I don't understand what I'm doing, but yet somebody has touched my hand. They're, they're leading me. It was the way that Samson was when he was blind. And he had to ask a lad, a little boy, uh, come here, place my hands, put my hand. You can see what I can't see. But I've got the power to touch what you can't touch. I can move what you can't move, but you can see what I can't see. But they're being brought together. When God now can see what we can't see and we're in darkness, he first touched the man's hand and led him out of the town. Maybe God has to touch your hand to lead you out of the company that you're around. To lead you out of the negativity. To lead you out of the rejection. To lead you out of the put down. To lead you out of the things that have tried to put you in a little box just defining you. And listen, don't let other people create your world because they will always create it too small. Always. Jesus took the man, touched him, took him by the hand. And led him out of the town before he ever laid his, touched his eyes. And we keep saying, Lord, open my eyes. Maybe he needs to touch your hand first. And lead you out of something. Because if you don't get out of the place that calls you to go blind, you'll go blind again. Jesus took the man out of town. He touched him by the hand and led him somewhere first. It was a touch from God. So there's a touch that heals. But Jesus took, uh, made a spittle and put it on the man's eyes, touched his eyes. Said, do you see? He said, you know, I got a parcel healing. I see men like trees walking. I got some vision, but it's not clear. I got a little understanding about the direction that God wants me to take, but I, I, I can't see this thing fully clearly. I, I don't have it. Listen, if you got a, a piece of a vision from God, well, just thank God you ought to just start rejoicing. God, I'm, I'm on the right road. I'm on the right road. If I walk with you and if I get another touch from you, you'll bring clarity to what you already are showing me. I, I see some sketchiness. I don't know how the full thing is going to work out. I don't know exactly who you're going to send in as a partner to help me to be able to make this thing come into full manifestation. But Lord, I, I can see the vision. I just can't see everything. I don't know exactly who it is. I see men like trees walking. I don't have a definition of the face yet. 
But I see something walking toward me. <laughs> I see destiny moving my way to empower me to fulfill the vision that God has given to me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, you need a touch from God and he's cleared up some things but not everything. But the second touch that he gave him brought clarity. He just brought healing through a touch because the touch of the Lord heals. The touch of the Lord heals. But here's I want, uh, another thing I want you to understand is that the wrong touch violates and scars and contaminates. You know, this is a perverted touch. This is a wicked touch. This is a touch that has ill intentions. The wrong touch, it violates, it scars, it contaminates. Notice what uh, uh, the Lord said in Genesis chapter 3 verse 3. But God says, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. There are some things that when you go to fumbling around with it, you go to touching it, God says, there's death in that thing. Yeah. Don't touch it because it will cause you to die. Maybe not immediately, but it will cause you to die. You keep touching it. You keep touching it and it will there's death in it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. There are certain things that if you touch it, it will violate the, the, the purity of your, of your character and of your consciousness. It will begin to scar you. It will contaminate your thinking and your belief system. Don't touch it. He says, don't, don't fool with this. So the wrong touch violates and scars and contaminates, but the right touch blesses and heals and empowers. I want you to see that. The right touch blesses and heals and empowers. It'll bless you. It'll heal you. It'll empower you. Uh, uh, Luke chapter 8 verse 46, Jesus said, someone touch me for I perceive that power has gone out from me. You know, this was a woman with the issue of blood that had been sick for 12 years. Jesus turned around in the, in the crowd and said, somebody touch me. And this lets you know that this is not an accidental touch. This is an intentional touch. You see, the Bible says that the, there was a multitude, a crowd of folks that was around Jesus, touching him, bumping in him. But when this particular woman touched him, it wasn't just a casual touch because you were in a crowded space. This was an intentional touch. This woman had already said in her heart that if I can just touch his clothes, if I can just make contact with him, I'm going to be made whole. She spoke this thing out that if I can touch Jesus, I'm going to be healed. He's going to make everything all right in my life. I've been bleeding at the place of intimate relationships. I've been having a hard time, but if I can touch Jesus here, if I can get a touch from him, she didn't just say, you know, if I can go through a particular course and have a, a, a particular seminar, if I can just get to the conference. No, no, no. If I can get a touch, if I can just touch him, if I can touch Jesus, if I can touch Jesus, if I can just touch just the, the skirts, the hem of his garment, the hem of his garment, the hem of his garment. If I can just touch that, I will be made whole. Because the touch of the Lord heals. The touch of the Lord, it heals. And, and then notice in Luke chapter 6 verse 19. And all the crowd sought to touch him. Wonder why they wanted to touch Jesus. For power came out from him and healed them all. Notice, I think it's because they had heard that woman's testimony. The woman with the issue of blood. She started something. She started some. All it takes is one child to come by, back from around the corner with some ice cream. All it takes is one person to come from the kitchen with a piece of chicken. I mean, you know, who started this? And, and then here comes a crowd that sought to touch him. They just said that they, 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 they sought to touch him. They didn't even seek to hear him. They sought to to touch him, to touch him, because they'd heard that power came from him. And the Bible says, and he healed them all. They touched him with intentionality because they, they said, I, I, I'm sick and I need to touch him. My God, our world is so sick and I think that we have been disconnected. We have a disconnection. And so the touching has discircuited the power from flowing to us. You know how when you go into a room and you flip the, the, the switch on to turn on the light? What happens, you know, when it's in the off position, it just actually knocks these two wires apart from each other. And when you flip it on, it causes the wires to touch. So, so one breaks the connection when you turn it off. And when you turn it on, it brings the two together so that they touch. And power only flows when you touch. And there is something about the touch. And we've gotten so sophisticated that we can do something in a wireless way, in a way that you don't have to 
touch any longer. But God didn't design for life to be lived without his touch. There is a touch from above that heals. The touch of the Lord heals. Secondly, the touch of the Lord comforts. The touch of the Lord comforts. It comforts. I mean, when you get upset, I mean, have you ever just seen people and, and they're just upset and sometimes people, you can't even, they can't even tell you what went wrong because there's a, and then he, and 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 they can't even get it out. They're so upset and sometimes you just have to touch them to help bring calm to their life because the touch from the Lord comforts us. We see that in Matthew chapter 17 verse 6 through 8. Notice the disciples were terrified and they fell face down on the ground and Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone and they saw only Jesus. Jesus touched them and something in his touch brought a calm from everything that was scaring the daylights out of them. He touched them and a calm came over them. He touched them and a calm came over them. He touched them. He touched them. Let me just say this. When words are inadequate, touch can mysteriously communicate what's in our heart. When words are inadequate, uh, touch can mysteriously communicate what's in our heart. Sometimes if a person has experienced a tragedy in, a tragedy in their life, if they be, a sickness, a death, uh, a, a, a deep loss of something that is vital and significant to them, when words are inadequate, touch can mysteriously communicate what's in our heart. It, it, you may not be able to articulate it. Sometimes you don't even know the words to say, but just your touch, the way you grip their hand, the way you hug them, says, no matter what you're going through, baby, we're going to get through this, and I'm with you. You're not alone, and we're going to get through this together. We're going to get, a touch conveys that. A touch says, I, I, I know he's gone now, I know she's gone now, but you're going to make it through this. You're going to live and not die. You're going to make it through this. It's going to be okay. You are going to make, a touch conveys that sometimes when words are inadequate, a touch can mysteriously communicate what's in our heart. And sometimes just the way you touch a person, it says, baby, I love you, and I'm with you, and I'm so proud of you. And they go on and do, make it do what it do. Just a touch can communicate that when you didn't even open your mouth. Just, just a touch. Just a touch. It reminds me of Diana Ross's song, Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. Isn't that amazing? Then the touch of the Lord, the touch of the Lord that we just reach out and touch. The touch of the Lord unifies. It not only heals, it not only comforts, the touch of the Lord unifies. When God touches a situation, things that were scattered in brokenness, they come into unity. They come into a oneness. It's God's desire, not that we be scattered. He doesn't want us to be separated by our nationality, by our gender. God wants to bring us into a oneness, just a oneness. Ephesians chapter 4, notice verse 3 through 6. Make every effort to keep yourselves, notice, united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, there is one Spirit, and just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. It is God that pulls us all together. He brings us into one. The Spirit of God, as He touches us, He unifies us. The moment that we are saved, we are baptized in a body, and whether I knew you or not, you are my brother, you are my sister. He brings us into a common family by His touch. By His touch. 
You, you, did you notice it in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 through 4? On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. Notice what happened. They gathered somewhere. They heard something they saw something they felt something and then they said something they were all gathered God gathered them in one place and, and, and then they they heard something they heard something what you hear has the ability to produce unity in you then they saw something cloven tongues like as a fire then the thing that they saw that sat on them when that fire sat on them my God they felt something and after they felt it, here come Ikola Baba Shaka. Oh boy, they start to say something. Isn't it amazing? I'm just telling you. I don't know about you, but I just don't want an intellectual experience with God. I want to be able to have God to touch me in a way. I understand scripture. I've studied Hebrew. I've studied Greek. And I've studied some Aramaic stuff. But I'm here to tell you that I, I, I tell you that's nothing like feeling a prayer wheel turning. There's nothing like feeling a little fire burning. Something deep down in my soul. I, I cannot explain that. It doesn't come from my head. It comes from something that I feel down on the inside of me. There's a little fire that God lights on the inside of a man and an inside of a woman. And it is by what I feel in me that lets me know that I am his and he is mine. And everybody who knows him is my brother and my sister. There was the touch of the Holy Ghost in a place when heaven touches the earth, the earth shakes. So the place where they were gathered was shaken. It is something that when we start praying until we are shaken, but it's another thing when the place <laughs> is shaken. When the place is shaken, the place is shaken. The place shook and then the people were changed. And then God used the people who were shaken and changed to then change the place. Shaking the place doesn't always change the place. God uses the changed people to change the place. It's amazing. But all of us who are Christians today, all of us who are Christians today, we're all Christians today because we were touched by the same message of Jesus Christ and accepted that same blood that redeemed each one of us. It was that common message because... The touch from the Lord unifies. It not only heals, it not only comforts, it not only unifies. Number four, the touch of the Lord transforms. Notice what it talks about in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 through 14. This is the Apostle Paul saying that not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I'm also apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't this amazing that the Apostle Paul says that I'm trying to apprehend that by which I was apprehended. Uh, you, you have to understand that the Apostle Paul was persecuting Christians. And then the divine sheriff of heaven met Paul on a road to Damascus. And instead of telling him to step out of the vehicle, somehow the supernatural divine sheriff put him under divine arrest. He apprehended him. Whenever you are apprehended <laughs> by the divine sheriff, you can't just go where you want to go, when you want to go. And he put his eyes out, locked him in solitary confinement in darkness for three days. And it was after he had been locked into this solitude that he says, you get up and you, you go to a certain place, you have so-and-so to pray for you. 
And then you'll come again seeing because I'm getting ready to bring you into some glorious light, but I got to put you in deep darkness so you'll appreciate the light and you'll understand the transformation that I'm bringing into your life. And so this is the apostle Paul. Paul said, I was apprehended. I was arrested by this man. The very man that, that, that apprehended me, now I'm trying to arrest him. You know why I want to arrest him? I want to arrest him so he stays with me. So that I can learn of him. I want to learn of him and I want to know him. My God, I want to know it. I want to apprehend that which apprehended me. I want to arrest him in my life so because he arrested me, I'm trying to arrest that. He says, not as though I already am perfect, but he says, I'm striving after that. I'm trying to apprehend. I'm trying to arrest him because he arrested me. This is Apostle Paul. He says, that, 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 that thing that arrested him transformed him. And sometimes God has to arrest you. He has to apprehend you, stop you in order to transform you. He's not trying to just break your spirit. He's trying to transform you. And so when the Spirit of God and, and when the God's truth, when they begin to touch your life, they transform you. They transform you. And I want you to realize this, that God can transform us through the intangibles of life. He can transform us through the intangibles of life. The, the intangible. Sometimes it's just the anointing that transforms. It might be a helping hand that God sends your way. It might be a smile. It might be recognition for something that you, that you did. It may be an opportunity. It could be an open door. Sometimes the thing that the intangible that, 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 that transformed you might have been a prayer. It might have been a song. It might have been a dance. It might have been a dramatic presentation. It might have been a letter, an email, a text message. Uh, it might have been a thoughtful gift. It might have been a phone call. It might have been somebody that you really valued them and they just paid you a visit and their presence was a gift. Sometimes God transforms you by sending you through trouble. I know you don't want to hear that. But God uses trouble to transform. Let me say it to you this way. Adversity is a bridge to a deeper relationship with God. I want you to understand that. Don't think that God's trying to kill you and punish you and all of this. Adversity is a bridge to a deeper relationship with God. There are some people that wouldn't get close to God unless something went wrong in your life. Adversity is a bridge to a deeper relationship with God. It could be a divorce. It could be a financial ruin. It could be legal problems that come into your life. It could be a health challenge. It could be some mental, emotional uh, instability or disability in your life. It could be a strained relationship with a significant person. It could be rejection. It could be false accusation and attack on your character. But you'll go through some trouble, some adversity. But the whole purpose that God will bring out of that is that God will transform transform you through trouble. He'll transform you through trouble. And uh, I'm not saying that God sends the trouble, but he uses it. Please understand this principle. Everything is either God sent or God used. Everything is either God sent or God used. Even if the devil sent it, God can use it to transform your character. He can use it to transform your character because adversity is a bridge to a deeper relationship with God. And sometimes it's through the trouble that God actually brings refinement to our life. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 and 11. He says, I want to know him. I want to have the same power in my life that raised Jesus from the dead. I want to understand and to share in his sufferings and be like Christ in his death, then I may be raised up from among the dead. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know him. There's something redemptive about unmerited suffering. There's always something redemptive about unmerited suffering. When you did nothing to deserve it and you go through something, there's something redemptive about it. The hand of God will redeem you. He will. But not only does God heal us through his touch, not only does he comfort us through his touch, not only does he transform us through his touch, but he also ordains through his touch. Something about it. He, he ordained kings this way. He ordained prophets this way. 
In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 and 20, so Elijah, Elijah went and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, plowing in the field. And there were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. And Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. He just touched him with his cloak. And Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go to be with you. And Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I've done to you. Think about it. Think about it. That touch called him into ministry. That touch was a call. He didn't even say anything. He just threw his cloak on him. And that touch called was his call into the ministry. Jesus uh, not only touches us, but he also calls us. Uh, notice uh, St. John chapter 15, verse 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I'm the one who called you. I chose you. Have you ever noticed 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 in the, the New Living Version? He is the one who saved us from the punishment of sin. He is the one who chose us to do his work. He chose us. He chose us to do his work. It is not because of anything we have done, but it was his plan from the beginning that he would give us his, long, his loving favor through Christ Jesus. And then here's another thing that the touch from above does. The touch from above communicates love and acceptance. The touch from above communicates love and acceptance. Notice in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 and 41, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. It communicated love and acceptance because in that day, if you had leprosy, you were the scourge of, of society. You had to live in a leper colony. You were ostracized from regular people. You were a part of the untouchables. And yet Jesus, having no regard for his own safety, touched the man with leprosy and said, I'm willing. He says, listen, you can hear me if you want to. Jesus said, I want to. He was moved with compassion. His compassion and love for him communicated love and acceptance to this leper that the rest of the society said, get away from him. Get, get away, that's contagious. Get away, oh, get away. Don't come over here. Don't come around my family. Don't come around. Get, get, you go over there. And Jesus was moved with compassion. One version says he was indignant. It translates the word compassion or pity as being angry or indignant. And I understand it. It's not an either or. I think it's both and. I know what it's like to pray for people that are bound with some demonic affliction in their life because out of my compassion for them, it makes me angry that the devil has done this. So sometimes the anointing will come on me and there's an indignation that says, devil, how dare you? How dare you? bring this cancer. How dare you? And I'm angrily praying with the might of the power of the Spirit of God, saying, God, give them a touch from above. And it is out of this compassion because you're angry over what the devil has done to God's people. How dare you? How dare you? That really then makes you want to pray with passion and compassion for their healing. And nothing more than that touch says... You are loved and accepted. That touch says you're loved and accepted. Who touches a leper knowing that their condition is contagious? Here's another thing that the touch from above does. The touch from above delivers. The touch from above delivers. Jesus didn't just heal the people. He delivered them from the evil spirits or the demons that were attacking them, oppressing their lives. 
And that's why sometimes when I've been laying hands on people, a righteous indignation rises in me. And there's a supernatural power of the Holy Ghost that comes. I remember a lady that had a, a, a cancer in her system and uh, filled up with demons. She was 73 years old. And, uh, and she flew here from another state to come and see me. She was bound by these demon spirits, had so much fear in her that she couldn't even uh, go out in public. I tried to get her to come into the church. She would not. I had to go to her hotel. And, uh, and, and I went down, I knocked on her door, and she opens the door. And uh, she said, I'm, I'm just so afraid. I'm, I'm so afraid. And I shared my testimony. I shared scripture. I, you know, I, I prayed with her, and, and I just felt no relief. And, and I told her, I said, you know, I've done everything that I know to do. And I said, I pray that God will give you a touch from him. And I turned to walk out of that hotel room. And as soon as my hand hit the knob on the door, righteous indignation rose up on the inside of me. I got angry at the devil. I turned around, my fist balled up. I didn't even understand what I was doing. And I came back and hit the woman, 73 years old, in the pit of her stomach. The moment that I did, she threw both hands up. She screamed, and every demon came pouring out of her life. But that was an indignation. I had given up. I said, God, I don't know. I said, but if, if there's anything else that you intend for me to do, God, you show me. He never explained anything. It just came on me. And I turned around and went to her without explanation and said, pow! And it was a touch from above. It wasn't my hand. It was his hand. But it was a righteous kind of an indignation that brought deliverance from tormenting demons. And this lady was a millionaire. And, uh, and, and she was bound up in fear. And the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost gave her a divine touch that delivered her from every demon that was oppro uh, 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 oppressing her life. Luke chapter 4, verse 40 and 41. Notice this in the Phillips translation. Then as the sun was setting, all those who had friends suffering from every kind of disease brought them to Jesus and he laid his hands on each one of them separately and healed them. And notice what happened. Evil spirits came out of many of these people shouting, you are the son of God. But he spoke sharply to them and would not allow them to say any more for they knew perfectly well that he was Christ. And he had not yet revealed his identity. But the demons knew. Jesus, when he touched them individually, prayed for them. The demon spirits came out. He not only heals, he also delivers. He delivers from the very source that made them sick and bound and oppressed to begin with. And not only does the touch from above deliver, the touch from above also blesses. It also blesses. Not only did the patriarchs of old uh, lay their hands on their children, various individuals, and bless, Jesus also did that. Uh, you'll notice in Mark chapter 10 and verse 16, and he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. He laid his hands on them and he blessed them because the touch from above blesses your life. Listen, I want you to just desire a touch from the master because it has transformative power for your life. Just a touch. There was a dear woman by the name of Myra Brooks Welch that wrote a beautiful poetic piece back in 1921. And it dealt with an old violin. And it talked about how it was put up for auction and how the auctioneer takes the old dusty violin and said, all right, can I get it? Can I get a dollar? One dollar, one dollar, one dollar, one dollar. Can I get one dollar? One dollar for the name of the Can I get two dollars? Two dollars, two dollars. Can I get two? Two going once. Can I get three dollars? Three dollars. Can I three dollars? Anybody got for four dollars? Four dollars. And he's going up. It's one, two, three. It's gotten up to four dollars. 
And an old gray-haired man gets up from the audience and he comes and takes the bow of the violin and he brushes the dust off of the old instrument and he tightens the strings to bring it into pitch puts tension on them isn't it something how when God is correcting us and he puts tension on the line and then he took the bowl and began to play the most melodious celestial piece and he put the violin down and the same auctioneer who started saying can I get one dollar one dollar can I get two came back and said now can I get 1,000? Can I get 1,000? 1,000? Can I hit 2,000? 2,000? 2,000? Can I hit 3,000? 3,000? Can I get 4,000? Anybody 4,000? And the people, the audience said, you were just selling it for one, two, and three dollars. Now you switched it to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, went up to 4,000 dollars. And he says, what changed? And he said that it was the master's touch. It was the master's touch. That showed that there was still worth and value. And it is the same master's touch that when your life is feeling worthless, like a piece of junk, that nobody wants you and you've messed up and you've done so many dirty things. And they act like you can't even make music anymore. And you're out of tune. Your life is out of sync with God. God knows how to put pressure on the things in your life to bring you back into pitch and it is when the master's touch comes on an old dusty life after he has cleaned you up by his own blood that he begins to then give you a song that the angels <laughs> cannot sing and then you hear this melodious sound from heaven and it doesn't bring attention to the instrument but to the master, to the virtuoso, who's actually playing, using that old instrument. And I'm just here to remind you today that God still uses old instruments. Don't ever think that you've done things too dirty for God to use you. Or that you're too old and out of shape and out of tune for God to use you. God will give you a divine tune-up. And he will cleanse you by the power of the blood of Jesus and put a pressure on your life. I'm just here to remind you today that no matter how long you walk with God, we need a fresh touch from him. And I just want you to just close your eyes. And just ask me, ask him, God, touch me, touch me. Touch me again, Jesus. Rikivers nutili bigia hasato. Moduli giva goretes. Lafredigasiku. Zitisicum regefas. Chakrans or rebusketes epios. Sicrus e anchkonomosia. Savradish lebrus every kunasa. When you make time for me, when you make a place for me, I will come to you like a bird goes to a feeder. And I will light upon your lives, and I will fill you with my touch. When you put away the things that distract your attention, and open yourselves to me once again, I've never lost any power. You've just disconnected from that power. And if you will open your heart and create a space, I will come and fill it. And once again, my touch will bring renewal, healing, restoration, and transformation into your life, saith the Lord. May God touch you by His Spirit. May He just touch you. Maybe just in this moment. Just have an openness. To say, God, touch me. That everything that's out of place, everything that's out of joint in my body, 
in my relationship, in my mind, in my thinking. God, touch me, touch me, touch me, God, fill me with your touch. With your touch, God, a touch from you. May you just be able to know that he touched me, he touched me. And he made me whole. He touched me. God, touch marriages today. Touch minds that are filled with anxiety, that have trouble sleeping at night. Touch the confused soul. <laughs> oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus. That as we give you a place and a space, God, may you fill it. <laughs> fill it, God. Fill it with your love and your power. Fill it with your grace and your truth. Fill it with your love and your compassion. Fill it, God. Touch us, God. Touch our minds, God, and steady them. Make them right, God. Regulate them. Touch our bodies, God, and bring restoration and healing to us. Oh, God, bring deliverance to us from every demonic thing that has caused us to live outside of your will. May you break its power. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, touch us once again. May you give us another touch, a fresh touch from you, God, to do what we cannot explain. But God, may you do it just in a touch. Just touch us with your presence today. God, we give you the permission to touch us. Whether we're in a home today, whether we're streaming on a cell phone, on a, on a tablet, on a computer, while looking at a television, touch! Because there's no distance in the spirit. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will touch your people and transform our lives. Not to just give us a good feeling, but a good living, a good desire, good character, good faithfulness, good temperance. Oh, God, we pray in the name of Jesus that your touch will bring peace <laughs> to everything, God, everything that has been out of kelter in our life, every disturbance. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will recalibrate us by the power of your touch. Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. May your touch, God, soothe arguments. May it just help us to realize it's not even worth it. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not worth it. May your touch, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, arrest that person that's about to do something stupid. Touch us, God, and redeem us. Bring us back from the edge. Bring us back from the edge by your touch. By your touch. Redeemed by your touch. Lord, you sent forth the Holy Ghost to touch us. Not to have a mental assenting towards you, but to touch us experientially. Oh, God, we, we submit to your touch today. May we feel you knowing that you are ever with us, walking with us, talking with us, and leaving us in such a way that our lives are never, ever the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I pray that you got something out of God's Word today. I pray that you would just ask the Lord to let you experience his touch and not only experience his touch but to be conduits of the touch from God that as he has touched you and you touch others that his touch of love and care and compassion and transformation will flow from you and touch them when power hits you and you are a conduit you introduce them to the very power that is shocking and empowering your life. And so, reach out and touch somebody's hand. Make this world a better place if you can. If you're without a church, we hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.